All right, everybody, welcome back uh, to another edition of Hawk After Dark. Uh, I'm actually, unlike last time, I'm actually recording this one after dark. Uh, so, you know, we have that going for us. Um, so I hope everybody's having a good week and hanging in there. You know, it's it's going to be a bumpy year. It just is. I'm recording this Sunday evening, February 4th. I just got done watching uh, a big chunk of the Grammys. I don't know. Uh, so, you know, I got to see all of that. Got to see Miley Cyrus. I like Miley Cyrus. I think she has a good voice. But uh, so what are we going to talk about this week? This week, we are going to talk about Republican sex scandals. Yeah, a nice uplifting topic. How did how did this come to pass? <laughs> um, a few days ago, I read uh, an article uh, by an opinion columnist named David French in the New York Times. And it is titled, When the Right Ignores Its Sex Scandals. And it's a pretty brutal article. I'm going to go through some of it, and then we're going to expand upon that uh, a bit. And it's a dark subject area, but I think it's important because, you know, especially with Donald Trump, I mean, that guy has been a walking sex scandal for 50 years and nobody on the right gives a shit at all. Uh, nor do they give a shit about any of their other panoply of sex scandals that have plagued the right. And there are sex scandals on, on the left as well, but you you know, like most recently, somebody like Anthony Weiner comes to mind who was caught sexting, uh, a 15 year old girl repeatedly. Uh, I think he even went to jail for it. And except for Bill Clinton, I will say this, except for Bill Clinton, I think the left is pretty good about when something like that happens within their own ranks. They get rid of that person, period. They're out. You're done. You're shunned. When, and I'm, and this is kind of a tangent, um, when the whole Bill Clinton thing happened in what was it like 1998 and it was clear what he had done. I mean, he eventually acknowledged everything that he had done and it was in, in having sexual interactions with a 21 year old intern while he was president of the United States, which is a fucking gross abuse of a power imbalance the president of the United States and a 21 year old volunteer intern. What I, one of the things that I remember the most about during that time was seeing prominent women who were feminists defending Donald Trump or Donald Trump, defending Bill Clinton and, and minimizing what he had done and what he had done to this, this young woman. And even then I was like, wow, that's fucked up. That's fucked up. There are feminists that are defending this guy, but they did. And, you know, after he left, uh, after he left the white house in 2000, he went on to become super good buddies with Jeffrey Epstein and flew on his jet a bunch of times. So that worked out. Um, Anyway, I digress. So getting back to this article uh, from David French. So a lot of it is about the uh, Southern Baptist Convention. And remember a year ago, two years ago, um, because I think in large part because of the process that was started by the story that I'm going to talk about, you know, they did the Southern Baptist Convention did like this internal audit and they ended up releasing like a several hundred page long report that identified, I don't know, like six or 700 uh, men within their church who had committed various acts of sexual abuse, sexual assault, sexual harassment, none of which had been dealt with 
the way that that kind of thing should be dealt with. And, you know, there were patterns of harassment and intimidation of victims, almost all of whom were women and young women, and and they were not believed, and a lot of them were drummed out of the church. And, you know, it just the the culture of covering up for these guys, for these men, you know, it's something that I think is still completely rampant in our society, and it's just gross and disgusting. And it is embodied by Donald Trump in his campaign for the presidency a second time um, and his history. And, you know, I mean, we'll talk about E. Jean Carroll here in a minute, but a, a, a judge in New York, a federal judge adjudicated that as a matter of law, Donald Trump is a rapist. A judge adjudicated that the conduct that Donald Trump was found liable for in the first E. Jean Carroll trial constitutes rape under New York statutory definitions. The leading candidate for the Republican Party is a rapist. And that is a factual statement that has been adjudicated by a court of law after a jury trial. And that's where we're at. That's where we're at. In 2024. Anyway. So I'm going to read a couple of sections of this article. And he starts off with, let me share with you one of the worst and most important recent news stories that you've probably never heard about. I had never heard about this. And I don't know anybody who reads more news than I do. Late last month, this article is dated January 28th of this year. The Southern Baptist Convention settled a sex abuse lawsuit against a man named Paul Pressler, never heard of him, for an undisclosed sum. The lawsuit was filed in 2017 and alleged that Pressler had raped a man named Dwayne Rollins for decades, with the rapes beginning when Rollins was only 14 years old. First of all, what the... The story would be terrible enough if Pressler were simply an ordinary predator, but while relatively unknown outside of evangelical circles, Pressler is one of the most important American religious figures of the 20th century. This is my shocked face. The amount of shit that gets covered up in churches is still mind-blowing to me. Pressler and his friend Paige Patterson, a former president of the Southern Baptist Convention, are two of the key architects of the so-called conservative resurgence within the Southern Baptist Convention. It conceived in the 60s, launched in the 70s, was wildly successful, ultimately uh, the SBC becoming the largest Protestant denomination in the United States. Y you know, around the time that... Uh, the Roe versus Wade opinion came out in like 1973, 1974. The Southern Baptist Convention was pro-choice. They were pro-choice as a religious organization. These two guys, Paul Pressler and Paige Patterson, that's a lot of P's. P, 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 P. Uh, these two guys are responsible for them becoming virulently anti-choice. Pressler and Patterson were heroes within the evangelical movement. Patterson led Baptist seminaries, became president of the convention. Pressler was a, Pressler, the guy who raped a young boy for decades, was a Texas state judge and a former president of the Council for National Policy, a powerful conservative Christian activist or organization. Both men are now disgraced. I mean, these guys, these guys were heroes within this movement for 15 years. Think about what they must have done and think about who they must have done it to. Because it wasn't just one guy. In 2018, the board of the SBC fired Patterson after it found that he had grossly mishandled rape allegations. 
uh, including writing in an email that he wanted to meet alone with a woman who had reported being raped to, quote, break her down. Pressler, his story is even worse. The evidence that people were aware of allegations against him stretch back decades. It takes just to, to take just two examples. In 1989, Pressler failed an FBI background check after George H.W. Bush tapped him to be to, to lead the Office of Government Ethics. And in 2004, First Baptist Church of Houston investigated accusations that Pressler had groped and undressed a college student, deemed his behavior morally and spiritually inappropriate, and warned him, but took no other action. Well, at least they warned him. Paul, don't do that anymore, Paul. Pressler's story, I thought this was a great kind of tie-in thing. Pressler's story in some ways is eerily similar to that of Harvey Weinstein. Both men were powerful and so brazen about their misconduct that it was an open secret in their respective worlds. Yet they were also so powerful that an army of enablers coalesced around them, protecting them from the consequences of their actions. A single predator, a single individual can be a predator, but it takes a village to protect him from exposure and punishment. Ultimately, it took uh, Dwayne Rollins' lawsuit to expose Pressler's actions. That suit set off a sprawling investigation into Southern Baptist Convention sexual misconduct by the Houston Chronicle and the San Antonio Express News. Their report documented hundreds of sex abuse cases in the SBC and led to the denomination commissioning an independent investigation. But the bottom line is clear. For decades, survivors of sex abuse were ignored, disbelieved, or met with the constant refrain that the SBC could take no action due to its policy regarding church autonomy, even if it meant that convicted molesters, convicted molesters continued in their ministry with no notice or warning to their current church or congregation. Coverage or lack thereof of Pressler's fall also helps explain why we're so polarized as a nation. And this is, this is, this next part is why I'm doing an episode on this. It's not just to talk about a bunch of fucking perverts. <laughs> Although, you know, we could do that too. <laughs> oh, God. The American right exists in a news environment that reports misconduct on the left or in left-wing institutions loudly and with granular detail. When Harvey Weinstein fell and that fall prompted the cascade of revelations that created the Me Too movement, the right was overrun with commentary on the larger lessons of the episode, including scathing indictments of a Hollywood culture that permitted so much abuse for so very long. And that was well-deserved. That reporting was well-deserved. I mean, Harvey Weinstein operated for 25 years, 30 years as a rapist in Hollywood. And he was protected and he was enabled because he won people Oscars and he made people money. Period. Period. But the coverage on the right also fit a cherished conservative narrative that liberal sexual values such as those in Hollywood invariably lead to abuse, yada, yada, yada. How does a typical conservative activist deal with the reality that there are guys like Paul Pressler and Paige Patterson by pretending it doesn't exist? The silence on this reporting on the right was deafening. If you mainly receive your information from right-wing news sources, the odds are good that you haven't seen this news at all. And, and the author is reminded of the minimal right-wing coverage of Fox News's historic $800 million defamation settlement with Dominion Voting Systems, the largest known media defamation settlement of all time. He consistently meets conservatives who might know chapter and verse of any second-tier scandal excuse me, in the liberal media, but to this day have no clue that Fox News outlet broadcasts some of the most expensive lies in history. 
And this, I thought was a really good point. This isn't some kind of selective ignorance. It's more like a cultivated ignorance in which news outlets and influencers and their audiences tacitly agree not to share facts that might complicate their partisan narratives. I thought that was a really good observation. Um, but, you know, the right, we're going to talk about some examples. They don't care about this shit. They care about power. They care about obtaining and maintaining power. And if the people who are part of that process with them, who are necessary cogs or whatever, in order for them to maintain power, do things like that, they don't care. They want to hold on to power. And, you know, think about, think about, just think about the microcosm of the 20, the, the, the 2020 election campaign and QAnon and all that shit. And everybody on the right was calling Joe Biden a pedophile saying that he was part of a cabal that tra sexually trafficked children through Ukraine and all that shit. And it goes back to the 2016 campaign as well, where they said Hillary Clinton in Comet Pizza was traffic sexually trafficking and molesting children in, in the basement of Comet Pizza outside of Washington, D.C., a pizza shop that doesn't have a basement, which resulted in a QAnon follower going to that restaurant with an assault rifle and firing that gun, it's telling workers, show me the basement. Because he heard about it on right-wing media. You know, meanwhile, Donald Trump was running for president as a Republican and we're going to talk about him in a minute. And then, you know, there was another example. There was another example. Think back to, it was the spring. I think it was 2021, 2021 or 2022. I can't remember. Um, when Joe Biden had nominated uh, Ketanji Brown Jackson to the United States Supreme Court. And Josh Hawley and Ted Cruz attempted to smear her by going through some of her past uh, work as, as a trial court judge. And they accused her, they inaccurately claimed that she had a record of handing out unusually light sentences in cases where defendants were accused of viewing child pornography. And then... You know, when she made it out of committee and the vote went to the full floor of the Senate and three moderate Republicans voted to confirm Kataji Brown Jackson to the court. Of course, our, our favorite potato, Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene tweeted Murkowski, Collins and Romney are pro pedophile. It. It's amazing. It's amazing. And, you know, and then, you know, then, then you see, you see things like in Florida with the, uh, the don't say gay bill and they're calling it an anti grooming bill because they're saying tacitly that teachers are pedophiles and school teachers are grooming children to sexually molest them. School teachers, school teachers have a hard enough gig as it is. And, and, and then they were saying that gay people uh, and gay, you know, members of the LGBTQ community were all pedophiles. And weirdly, <clears throat> the crazy thing about that, you know, as much as as much as Republicans scream and squawk and yell about child sexual assault and saying that it's all the LGBTQ community and, and it's all school teachers, you, you know, around 90 percent of the people who are arrested in the United States for committing child sexual assault are straight white Christian men. They're not trans. Uh, they're not drag queens. They're not LGBTQ. 93% of the, 
of the victims of child sexual assault know their perpetrator. 60% of them are acquaintances, 34% of them are family members, and I'm guessing the rest are people that they met at church. Uh, you, you know, I mean, the scandal with the Catholic Church that came to light, when did all that come to light? Late 80s, early 90s? And then globally, globally, it has been discovered that the Catholic Church, I mean, you want to talk about a cabal of child sex offenders, global, I think you just fairly accurately described the Catholic Church. Sorry about that if that's upsetting to anybody. Um, not all Catholics, right? Okay, there you go. And But getting back to that Florida don't say gay bill, you, you know, the thing that blew everything up with uh, Ron DeSantis and Disney that resulted in a lot of litigation was that Disney put out a statement saying, hey, that bill's kind of fucked up. And which led to conservative social media influencers and Fox News hosts launching a campaign against Disney, accusing Disney of also being complicit in grooming and pedophilia. I mean, if you disagree with the right, if you criticize the right now, today, in 2024, they just point at you and call you a child molester. the worst fucking thing a human being can be except for a Trump supporter. I'm kidding. Uh, you know, and I mean, just think, think back. So in 2006, Florida representative, Mark Foley Republican was forced to resign. He'd sent sexually explicit messages and propositioned a bunch of male teenage congressional pages, you know, and this one, I mean, this one wasn't even 10 years ago. Dennis Hastert, I think he was from uh, Illinois, uh, Republican congressman, the longest ever serving Republican Speaker of the House, and for whom there is now named this rule called the Hastert Rule. What the Hastert Rule is for Republicans, it's like if if you have a Republican majority any legislation that passes, it has to have a majority of votes that are all Republican, meaning that it could pass exclusively with Republican votes, 218 Republican votes. And they call that the Hastert rule. And it's named for a serial pedophile who sexually abused high school rec wrestlers uh, when he was a coach. And he had done that for years and years and years before he ever got to Congress, before he became Speaker of the House. And that, and he's in prison, but that's not what he went to prison for. He went to prison for money laundering because of how he was trying to do hush money payments to one of his victims. He's still in, he's, nothing is more stunning than having a serial child molester, than having serial child molester and Speaker of the House in the same sentence, referring to the same person, wrote the trial court judge in Dennis Hastert's sentencing. <laughs> we'll get to Donald Trump in a minute. Um, I, 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 I did a kind of a deep dive in reading up on his history of sexual abuse allegations, and they go back 50 years. And, they, and a lot of them involve teenagers. Yeah. Um, then, then just, you, you know, just after the 2016 election, when Donald Trump got elected in the 2018 midterms in Alabama, the Republican party nominated as their candidate, Roy Moore, who very much enjoyed having sex with teenage girls. And they nominated him. And Donald Trump endorsed him. Donald Trump endorsed him. At, he preyed on girls as young as 14 and 16. He had a habit of trying to pick up high schoolers. And, and he was so not notorious about it that it got him banned from a local mall. He was doing it so much that he got banned from a local shopping mall. 
and Republicans nominated him for the United States Senate from the state of Alabama. They didn't care. They want power. They want majorities. Then we have jockstrap Jim Jordan, one of Trump's fiercest allies. Um, he allegedly participated in a cover-up of the sexual abuse of more than 177 male student athletes at the Ohio State University, where he was an assistant wrestling coach. Uh, that abuse was committed by the wrestling team doctor, uh, Richard Strauss, who died uh, and is not here to discuss that with anybody. Um, numerous former wrestlers told reporters that Jordan was personally aware of the abuse during the early 90s, but chose to turn a blind eye. He has always denied that. Multiple, multiple, multiple Ohio, former Ohio State wrestlers had said, I told Jim Jordan about it personally. I had conversations with him about it. And Jim Jordan said, if that doctor ever tried to do that to me, I'd kill him. Jim Jordan knew and did nothing about it. Which, how, how, how does that even fucking work? How do you find out about something like that and do nothing? Especially when you're a coach of student athletes and your student athletes come to you and say, hey, coach, we got a problem with the doctor. He's doing X, Y, and Z. How do you, as a student coach, make, what's the calculus where you make a decision in your own mind to say, no, I'm not going to say anything about that. I'm not going to say anything about that. That is so fucked up, man. And I think most notoriously recently, we have Florida Representative Matt Gates, who the investigation into him has been revived. It's been revived by the House Ethics Committee, I think. Investigating him for sex trafficking, underage sex, drugs, you know, basically money laundering, paying money and transporting minors across state lines. And it it's it's crazy. But but getting back to the the nomination of Katanji Brown Jackson, the crazy thing was that the same day that the Senate voted on her and confirmed her nomination to the United States Supreme Court. That same day, a former Republican National Committee staffer was sentenced to prison for possession of child pornography. <laughs> you, you know, and it's like, if there's one thing that we've learned, if there's one thing that we've learned, man, it's that every, alleg every allegation is a confession. It's projection. Every accusation is projection and a confession. And, you know, and it's like with the allegations against Roy Moore, Donald Trump endorsed him while he was president. Don Trump was president in 2018. He endorsed Roy Moore. And the RNC, the Republican National Committee, which had pulled its funding from Roy Moore, as soon as Donald Trump endorsed him, the RNC restored its funding and said, we stand with the president. And they funded the rest of his campaign. They funded the rest of his campaign. They had multiple direct allegations from women who are now adults. It was like, yeah, he picked me up when I was 14 years old. The Republican National Convention restored their funding to his campaign because they care about power and nothing else. When it came to Jim Jordan in 2018, then House Speaker Paul Ryan, good old Paul Ryan, who now sits on the board of Fox News or News Corp, whatever the parent company is, uh, he refused to open an ethics inquiry into Jim Jordan, uh, and he called Jim Jordan a man of honesty and integrity. Cool. I I don't know that it's true. I have no evidence that it's true, but I've, you know, I'm from Ohio. I grew up in Ohio. I have long heard, uh, and Jim Jordan and I went to the same law school, but at different times. Um, 
I have long heard allegations. Jim Jordan lives somewhere up around Lima, Ohio, which is kind of northwest in the state, uh, that the the local police uh, near where he lives uh, have there have been domestic violence situations at Jim's house. We'll put it that way. That's the allegation that I have heard uh, for many, many years. I have no direct evidence as to whether or not that's true, but it's a rumor that's been going around for quite some time. So who knows? Um, you, you know, and then like in 2018, after those allegations came out against Jim Jordan, then we get to 2020, Joe Biden gets elected. Then Jim Jordan's colleagues, selected him to become the top ranking Republican on the House Judiciary Committee, which handles federal criminal legislation, including on issues such as sex trafficking and child pornography. And I know all of us on the left love to talk about how amazing Liz Cheney is, given what she did with the January 6th committee uh, and how she has spoken out against Donald Trump. Liz Cheney, then the number three Republican in the House, said that the, the selection of Jim Jordan to lead the House Judiciary Committee was, quote, a totally unified decision all around. So Liz Cheney voted for Jim Jordan to head uh, <laughs> the House Judiciary Committee in 2020. Yeah. So there you go. Um, and... Uh, yeah, so the uh, the House Ethics Committee is still investigating Matt Gates. I think I think there's still uh, a good amount of civil litigation going on in the state of Ohio uh, at the state court level uh, with regard to Jim Jordan and the wrestling coach and all of that good stuff. But let's go back over some Republican sex scandal highlights uh, of recent times. Matt Schlapp, uh, he runs the. He runs CPAC, uh, the P Conservative uh, Political Action Committee. Uh, it's, he, he's the head of the American Conservative Union, which puts on CPAC. It is a virulently anti-LGBTQ organization. They hate gay people. Well, Matt Schlapp has now been sued uh, by three men uh, who all accuse him of sexual assault, uh, basically saying that Matt Schlapp likes to get drunk and forcibly fondle men's genitals without their consent, presumably over the pants, uh, you know. So that's what he likes to do for fun. Uh, his wife, Mercedes Schlapp, that's quite a name. Uh, I don't know how she feels about, you know, being married for 30 years to a guy who likes to forcibly fondle other men, young men. Lauren Boebert. Lauren Boebert was caught fondling and being fondled by her date at the family-friendly musical Beetlejuice in Denver. I mean, she's, you know, okay, so she switched. She switched districts because she was going to lose re-election in, in her current district where she's been serving since 2020. And under normal circumstances, she would lose her primary but there's like 10 Republicans running against her. So she has like 30% of the vote and everybody else has like four or 5%. And, and, and most, the majority of the Republicans that she's running against have all been arrested and have criminal records. And that's completely fine with the GOP base because they care about power, period. They don't care about stuff like this. They don't give a shit. Let people go do whatever they want to do. We just want power. But they're going to pass legislation telling everybody else it's illegal to be gay or lesbian or for gay people to get married or adopt children. Fucking hypocrites. Christian and Bridget Ziegler in Florida. I've talked about these guys quite a bit. He was the head of the Florida GOP. She's a co-founder of Moms for Liberty. Their two besties are Ron and Casey DeSantis. Yeah. Yeah. And these two were swingers having threesomes. And while, while, while he was pushing the don't say gay bill and while she's pushing all kinds of anti LGBTQ stuff with, uh, moms for Liberty, you know, and they're having threesomes with other women. 
The Florida Republican Party has censured Christian Ziegler and has stripped him of his authority, but he still holds the job. And she still holds her position with Moms for Liberty and I think sits sits on a school board. <laughs> Jerry Falwell Jr. Oh, my God. Speaking of, yeah. Jerry Falwell's dad, obviously, started Liberty University, you know, started the moral majority through the 70s and the 80s. He was tight with Reagan uh, and the Bush family and George W. Bush and, y- you know, was just it was just a hateful, hateful, hateful homophobic man. Uh, you, you know, I think he's I think he's the one that said, you know, like 9-11 was caused by lesbians or some shit and that hurricanes are caused by gay people. I mean. That's the that's the level of intellectual discourse that we're talking about with Jerry Falwell's dad. Well, Jerry Falwell Jr., after his dad died, he took over Liberty University. He was the president of the university. And he and his wife, he and his wife had a pool boy named Giancarlo. Giancarlo. Giancarlo the pool boy, uh, who used to have sex with Jerry Falwell Jr.'s wife while Jerry Falwell Jr. sat in the corner and watched. Just like Jesus would do. Absolutely right. And, you know, so, but he resigned. He resigned his position as president of Liberty University, and they gave him a $10.5 million severance package. Yeah. Larry Craig, this one goes back a couple years. Larry Craig was a Republican senator from Idaho who tried to have anonymous sex with a man in a bathroom. Uh, and that man turned out to be an undercover policeman. And Larry, Larry Craig was like sliding his foot under the stall into the next guy's stall and tapping his foot, which apparently is a signal. <laughs> tap, tap, tap. <laughs> I, you know, I don't, maybe that's like the hanky coat or something. I have no idea, man. But apparently, apparently that's the universal signal for, you know, come to my stall for sex. Tap, tap, tap. <laughs> Larry Craig very famously was like, I wasn't, I didn't signal anything. I, I have a wide stance. <laughs> uh, there are some other oldies and goodies, but I'm going to, I'm going to skip ahead here to, to Donald Trump. Donald Trump, the president of the United States from 2017 to 2021 has been accused of rape, sexual assault, sexual harassment, non-consensual kissing, and groping by at least 25 women since the 1970s. There was a book that came out in 2019, All the President's Women by Barry Levine and Monique L. Fazy, which contained another 43 additional allegations of sexual misconduct. So we'll talk about a couple things here. So during the 2016 campaign, uh, he very famously, although it didn't, I don't think it came out until after election day. Uh, he very famously paid Stormy Daniels $130,000 in hush money, uh, to keep her quiet about, uh, him and her having sex, uh, while Melania Trump was pregnant with Baron Trump. And he paid a, I think she, I can't remember her name, but she was a Playboy model, uh, paid her the same sum during the same period of time, $130,000 to keep their sexual activity quiet. Um, and then we have the whole E. Jean Carroll thing. So I'll start with the E. Jean Carroll, then I'll go back to Stormy Daniels. E. Jean Carroll, uh, he raped her in, in the, in the early nineties in, in a dressing room, uh, at a, in a department store in Manhattan, uh, he forcibly and without consent and totally out of the blue, uh, you know, like pinned her to a wall and stuck his fingers inside of her vagina. A year ago, a New York jury agreed with her and awarded her $5 million uh, in a defamation case and found him liable for sexual abuse, which that judge later amended to say he's a rapist. That fits the definition of rape under New York law. He continued to defame her, and then just a week ago, uh, a second New York jury 
awarded her $83.3 million uh, from Trump for more defamation. Interestingly, and he was posting shit about her during that trial to Truth Social. I think the first day of the trial, he posted like 44 things. Another day when he was in court, he posted like 22 things about her while they're in court. Since that verdict came out, he has not uttered her word or her name. Uh, he has not said uh, anything about her. So it seems like 80 million bucks is the sweet spot for defamation uh, for Donald Trump. Uh, 80 million bucks gets him to shut up. Now, Stormy Daniels. He paid her 130 grand. And because he was running for president at the time, uh, there was a lot of question as to whether or not that was for the benefit of the campaign and whether that payment should have been disclosed on, on his FEC forms. <laughs> or if it was disclosed, you know, that, I mean, they categorized that payment wrong. They laundered it through like Michael Cohen or, you know, it did a bunch of super, sa- super shady stuff with regard to that payment. Which, you know, uh, I I don't think it was directly for those payments, but Michael Cohen, his attorney who handled those payments, he went to jail, uh, I think, for perjury and for lying to Congress about that, those circumstances. And, and Donald Trump was named in that indictment. Donald Trump was individual number one. Uh, you know, Michael Cohen did this at the direction of individual number one. And. And he made these payments at the direction of individual number one. Donald Trump was in that indictment in, in that indictment. And he, he had just been inaugurated as president. I think it was in, within his first year in office. And, you, you know, but so the interesting thing now is that that conduct and, and those actions taken by Trump and others form the basis for the very first criminal indictment of a former president ever in the history of the United States. That indictment was brought um, about a year ago. It was last spring, I think, um, by Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg. 34 felony counts against Donald Trump. 34 felony counts. Each one of those counts carries a maximum of four years in prison. And that trial was set for March 25th less than two months from now. And that trial date was set pretty early on. It was set several months ago. And that trial date's just been hanging out there. It's just been kind of hanging out there under the radar. Um, Nobody's really been talking about that case. Everybody's been talking about Jack Smith and the DC case and the Mar-a-Lago case. And everybody's obviously recently been talking about Fonnie Willis and the floor and the Georgia Fulton County, Georgia Rico case Nobody's been talking about that Manhattan, that Manhattan case. And it's set for trial on March 25th. And it's very, very likely going to go to trial on March 25th. Yeah. And because the, the J6 case in Washington, D.C. with Judge Tanya Chutkin has been bumped, uh, that one's probably going to be rescheduled in April or May. Um, but that one will that one will conclude before the election. I guarantee it. I guarantee you the J6 case will happen and be concluded, and Donald Trump will be convicted of felonies in that case before election day. Donald Trump will also be convicted of felonies in the Manhattan case. So there you can have a situation where the the Republican nominee for president, you know, by September of this year has been convicted of somewhere between four and thirty-eight felonies. Yeah. Again, Republicans, elected Republicans, the Republican base, they don't give a shit. They care about power. They don't care about the sexual abuse of women or girls. They don't care about the sexual abuse of men or boys. They care about power. And if they're, if they have someone in their ranks who helps them achieve power, who's got a thing for pale young boys, they're going to look the other way because they want power, period. Um, it's a sick dynamic and there are all kinds of religious overtones to it that I could probably, I'm sure I could do a whole series of episodes on that. Um, but that's it. It's about power, plain and simple. 
obtaining power, maintaining power, and imposing their will on the rest of us. That's what they want to do during a second Trump administration. Impose their view, impose their version of morality on the rest of us when they don't even live by that same code of morality. It's just fucking amazing. It's amazing. So anyway, um, thank you uh, for tuning in. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I did. Yeah, as always, massive thanks uh, to uh, my brother Falcon, uh, without whom none of this would be possible. And as always, a big shout out to our buddy Wiseacre for his incredible graphics uh, and my buddy Anu for letting us use his music in our intros and outros. As always, hawkmerchstore.com for the merch and uh, hawkpodcasts.com. Uh, we put five podcasts up a week, um, four different podcast shows. Uh, three of them I do one episode, one of them I do two episodes. So there are a lot more episodes available at hawkpodcasts.com. I hope everybody has an amazing week, and I look forward to seeing all of you again soon. All right, take care. <laughs>